Welcome, everybody, to the first National Committee public event of 2019. Happy New Year. A little late for solar, early for lunar, but that <laughs> must mean we're doing okay. I'm Margot Landman with the National Committee. I think you've probably figured that out. And speaking to us today is Kelly Sims Gallagher, who has written this very interesting book about policy making related to climate change in both the US and China. And I am not going to say anything more about her because you have her bio. And I will turn it over to you. OK, Thank great. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you rather I stand? Yes. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think that's better. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And I'd like to thank the National Committee for hosting this, and especially Jan Barris and Marga Landman for arranging everything. Um, and before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge my co-author, Xuan Xiaowei, who really wanted to be here, actually. He is a um, senior researcher at the Development Research Center of the State Council of China. And he's currently posted in Xinjiang. So it's really hard for him to get all the way to New York uh, quickly. So he wasn't able to make it, but uh, he wanted to be here. Um, so this, um, this book is called Titans of the Climate. I have too many things I need to hold here. Um, and you the can put the mic thing down. Yeah. OK. Put that down. OK. Yeah. And um, <coughs> the cover image uh, you can see here uh, is called Overthrow of the Titans by Rubens. Um, and I selected this image um, because the United <coughs> States and China are titans of the climate. Um, in ancient Greek mythology, the titans were the original gods, uh, for those of you who've studied your, your Greek mythology, um, born from Uranus, who was the ruler of the sky and cosmos, um, and Gaia, who was ruler of the earth. And Kronos overthrew his father, who had made a prophecy that his own children would rebel against his rule. Kronos was terrified that his children would rise up against him, and so he ate all of his children when they were born, all except for Zeus. Um, and Zeus was hidden by his mother, Rhea, and indeed he rose up as leader of the Olympians to fight against the Titans due to their unhappiness with Titan rule. Um, and his brothers and sisters were recovered through regurgitation. Um, so <laughs> the Titans were the gods and goddesses who governed the Earth's sun, moon, waters, and land. So this reminds us of climate change. Um, and the mortals lived in fear of these Titans and the Olympians. Um, you may remember that Prometheus, uh, who was a titan, gave the mortals fire, which ironically gave us the ability to combust fossil fuels and produce <laughs> CO2, um, and taught them the art of civilization, um, and for that was punished by Zeus for all eternity. Um, so during the Battle of the Titans, which is depicted here, the titans and Olympians were fighting amongst themselves, and eventually the titans lost and the mortals had to live with the consequences. So there's no direct allusions um, or analogies, but there are some allusions. Um, the first is that no other two countries have the ability to have as much influence over the Earth's climate than the United States and China. Um, actually, together, and this may be hard for some of you to see, um, they account for nearly half of global emissions uh, today. 42% of um, carbon dioxide emissions in 2018. Um, and while China surpassed, as you can maybe see um, here, you can see China surpassed the United States in 2007. Um, uh, on a per capita basis, China is still half uh, US emissions. Uh, it has just surpassed the EU on a per capita basis. Um, so, and then cumulatively, um, it's worth noticing that uh, since the <coughs> beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 
Uh, the EU accounts for the majority of cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the United States, you know, swallowed a rabbit here, <laughs> uh, but grew and then has constrained. And then you can see China has just, you know, really started to begin contributing to this cumulative um, amount of greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. Okay, so going back to our, our illusions, um, as we saw in the Obama-Xi era, when these two countries can get along, they can achieve great things. And we saw that in the U.S.-China joint announcements of 2004, um, and that leadership arguably led to the Paris Agreement. Um, but when they fight, they force the rest of the world, us mortals, uh, to live with the consequences. And another possible analogy is that the leaders who are not just will be challenged and potentially overthrown. And so this may seem like a bit of a stretch, but if the U.S. and China cannot find a way to come together to address climate change, the rest of the world might rise up against them. Um, because after all, why should they suffer the consequences of climate change? And this is really starting to happen. There is really starting to be great resentment, particularly um, in least developed countries, the small island states that are so terribly vulnerable uh, to climate change. Okay, so climate change is real, um, and there has been a significant rise in global greenhouse gas uh, emissions and consequently temperature change. This is a NASA picture um, that compares the average temperature from 2013 to 2017 with a baseline of 1951 to 1980. So yellow, orange, and red is warmer. Red is the warmest of all and blue is cooler. And so hopefully you can see we've had significant warming, um, especially in high northern latitudes. So you may have seen the New York Times article this week about how Greenland was melting much faster than was anticipated. Um, it's not surprising. Look what's happening in Greenland, if I can make my little pointer work. Very, very rapid temperature change um, during that period. Um, the Paris Agreement, which was agreed to in 2015, three years ago, December 2015, was very significant as a global agreement. Um, if there hadn't been um, the Paris Agreement, our greenhouse gas emissions would just be rising kind of inexorably. Then, um, as a result of the Paris Agreement, you know, it looks like we've sort of bent the curve down there's a little bit of conditionality here because some developing countries said we will reduce emissions even more if we get financial assistance. Um, so you can see the unconditional contributions in the Paris Agreement get us to this point. And then if, you, uh, if there's financial aid essentially to uh, developing countries, you could actually get a significant reduction um, <coughs> below that. Uh, but what we really need to do to stay within two degrees warming is bend down very significantly um, our total greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, um, so let me start with um, a different era, which was just a few years ago. <laughs> the U.S.-China joint announcement of November 2014 um, and in this announcement, the, the two countries um, committed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the U.S. pledge was to reduce emissions 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025, with, with best efforts to achieve 28 percent. And China committed um, to peak its emissions around the year 2030. Um, and it made three other pledges, but that was a very significant one. Another one was 20% of, of primary energy from non-fossil fuels, carbon-free fuels. Um, and they said they would make best efforts to peak early. Um, so that was the sort of reciprocal agreement in the U.S.-China joint announcement. And one year later, 
The two countries did a joint statement on climate change where they said, we're actually going to announce steps for implementation of our own bilateral agreement. So no matter what happens in Paris, we are implementing our own agreement. And that was a very strong signal uh, that I think helped contribute um, to the achievement of the Paris Agreement. So how quickly um, the mature relationship that appeared to be emerging between the US and China has deteriorated um, since then. And I think we have to ask the question, why? How did we go from getting to um, such a hopeful place to such a hopeless place in a matter of just a couple of years? I think um, the first answer to that is that we have a profound lack of understanding of each other. Um, and that has led to the rise of myths and conspiracy theories in both countries. Um, and um, so let me just give you a few examples. Um, here in the United States, in 2012, uh, now President Donald Trump tweeted that the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. This is a quote that has been memorized by every single official in the Chinese government. Um, it, of course, it's incendiary. It's frustrating. Of course, it's not true. OK. Conversely, um, there is a Chinese talk show host, um, Larry Xianping Lang. Uh, and he, had, he did an episode called Climate Change Great Swindle. Um, and one of the viewers, it has millions of uh, viewers uh, on this clip, if you watch it. Um, and, and one of the viewers wrote, these foreign bastards are so worried China will rise and surpass the United States. Because they're jealous of China, they even made up lies about China and other developing countries. These scientists are all puppets controlled by politics, Copenhagen liars, American liars. So Copenhagen refers to uh, one of the rounds of negotiations uh, that took place in 2009. Um, these sort of conspiracy theories or myths have morphed um, and even make it into mainstream media and um, onto the Senate floor. So I have a few more examples for you. Um, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, the former Ministry of Environmental Protection in China, uh, wrote a paper saying that the Copenhagen Accord was a conspiracy by developed nations to divide the camp of developing nations. Um, about uh, a little earlier than that, uh, Senator James Inhofe, who was the former chairman of the Environment Public Works Committee in the US Senate, still is in the Senate, is no longer chairman, uh, wrote that Kyoto represented an attempt by certain element in the international community to restrain US interests. The Guardian, a uh, prominent newspaper, uh, says that China's top-down engineering approach means it can set big goals and reach them. Um, maybe a little less incendiary, but not correct. And then Xinhua, uh, China's state news agency, uh, says Trump's rise is the fall of US democracy because it illustrates the malfunction of the self-claimed world standard of democracy since the American people don't choose a president who's responsible to lead the country. So you can just see how um, these myths um, are perpetuated. So we wrote this book because we wanted to try to challenge some of these myths and demystify the other country for each other. Uh, we do two case studies related to how climate change policy is, is formed and how it's implemented to inform I think what is a more generalizable book about how the policy process works in both countries um, and why these sorts of myths um, reflect a real lack of understanding of each other. Um, so we identify eight factors in the book um, that really explain why the two countries uh, end up having very different policy outcomes. And I'm going to walk through those now. So the first is party politics. 
which are actually ubiquitous in both countries, but they manifest themselves so differently. You know, they're almost incomparable. <laughs> um, clearly, in the United States, um, actually, environmental protection issues used to be um, an, an area of bipartisan consensus. Some of us can still remember that. Um, and it was really, I think, during the um, Gingrich Revolution that that consensus started to fall apart. Uh, it, that was right after the bipartisan passage of the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. And there was a perception in the United States that there had been regulatory overreach. And um, a lot of the Republicans started to pull back. Um, so we have had a complete impasse in Congress on this issue uh, ever since the early 1990s. Um, luckily, right before that happened, um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was negotiated um, by George Herbert Walker Bush, and it was ratified by the US Senate. So the United States remains party to the UNFCCC, um, and President Trump has said nothing about pulling out of that convention. Uh, which is quite interesting. Um, he probably doesn't know about it. <laughs> it's possible. Let's not tell him. Um, so uh, the U.S. Congress has been unable to pass climate legislation um, all this time, uh, even though a supermajority of Americans um, say they're worried about it. There was a poll released this week um, that actually showed 72% of Americans are worried or very worried about global warming. Um, so it's, it's a puzzle, right? You have this super majority of Americans who would like to see action, and yet you can't get it through um, the Congress. And I think you can only explain that because of party politics. <coughs> um, in China, uh, we probably spent more time trying to figure out this graph, with y which you don't need to <laughs> be able to see. But, you know, as we wrote this book, we would sort of encounter sort of stumbling blocks where I just couldn't understand how something worked in China, even though I have spent lots of my life there, and he just couldn't understand how things worked in the U.S. And one of the things that, you know, remains sort of mystifying to me is the role of the party in the policymaking process. And so what we're trying to show here is that the Chinese Communist Party, you know, is truly diffused throughout all aspects of the administrative state. Um, but it is also important to know there are a lot of other parties that exist in China and are tolerated. Um, and even some of the, um, you know, senior ministers are sort of prominently chosen um, to show mm -hmm. that the Chinese Communist Party is open to other parties. Um, but nonetheless, the party of power is the Chinese Communist Party, without any doubt. Um, and um, that helps us in a climate change context, because there is apparent consensus within the party about the need to act on climate change. And so because there isn't political debate about this, uh, it's much easier <laughs> to actually um, achieve policy development and implementation in the Chinese case. Okay, second, separation of powers. Um, of course, the main goal of the separation of powers in the US Constitution is to introduce checks and balances so that no one branch or powerful person can exercise unchecked power. Um, of course, this is not mirrored in China. Um, we have a very strong administrative state um, that completely dominates over the legislative and judicial branches of government. And the CCP exerts control throughout all three branches um, by infusing them with party leaders. Um, and the danger, of course, is that you have the so-called bad emperor phenomenon. And many people are worried about this now in China, now that Xi Jinping has consolidated uh, power. But the advantage, um, clearly, is that you can design and implement coherent and coordinated policies and you can take a longer term view because you're not worried about losing your next election. You can afford to plan uh, for the longer term. The third area that really 
uh, is, is fundamentally different and results in very different policy outcomes is government hierarchy. So in China, we have a very hierarchical um, approach uh, where there's five formal levels of government. Um, each level is allowed to create policy, <coughs> but it cannot do so without approval from the next level up, and in turn the next level up. It has to go all the way up. Um, and uh, each level is obliged to implement the policies of the levels above it. Um, so it's harder to, it can be harder for the <coughs> provinces in China to do novel things unless that's embraced by the central government. And sometimes it is embraced because the government, the Chinese government loves to experiment uh, mm -hmm. at the provincial level or even at the city or township level. Um, and it will often experiment um, around the country and then bring those policies up to the national level. And a really nice example of that uh, were the emissions trading uh, regimes. There were seven pilot emissions trading regimes in China. And then they learned from that experience and then um, uh, made a national emissions trading scheme for their power sector that they um, instituted last year. Of course, in the United States, the U.S. has two parallel systems of government, the federal and the state. And the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution states that power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, um, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And here we can have um, direct enforcement of federal policies at the local level and, of course, state policies. Um, can be directly enforced. And that is something China is not capable of doing. The central government does not have enforcement capability on the ground. Um, and that is a real challenge. So sometimes the central government really wants to do something and they have a really hard time convincing the local mayors uh, to actually do what they want. Um, okay. Bureaucratic authorities. Uh, I think this actually, in my experience working in government, um, I realized this caused a lot of confusion um, in the U.S. government because the bureaucracies do not mirror each other very well. And so a lot of times in the United States, um, people were confused about who are they supposed to be negotiating with on the Chinese side. Um, so for example, up until this recent reform, uh, the National Development and Reform Commission, the former State Planning Commission, um, was responsible for climate change policy, not the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Um, so what would have been natural for the U.S. EPA um, to meet with the Ministry of Environmental Protection didn't make any sense um, in a climate change context. MEP had no authority uh, for climate change. Um, They've just done a reform and they've created this new so-called super ministry of ecology and environment. Um, and so they moved climate over there but kept energy in NDRC, uh, which creates another headache, a different type of headache. Um, and meanwhile, the Department of Energy in the United States, the best analog to that is the Ministry of Science and Technology in China. And so it was always very difficult for DOE to figure out who they should meet with when they went to China. Should it be NDRC or should it be most? Um, so uh, these differences, I think, um, make it hard to understand the policy process in the other country. Um, but this is one area where we really saw a lot of similarities because bureaucratic rivalries exist everywhere, I think. Um, and they're just as strong and powerful in China as they are in the United States. Um, next, fifth, was uh, economic structure and strategic industries. And I didn't know how to make a beautiful picture um, because what I really wanted to show was how different, uh, differently structured the two economies are and how that manifests itself differently in terms of influence, lobbying influence, political influence, economic interests in the policy process. So I think the main thing to notice is that in the United States, 
you know, we are really a service-based economy now. That's the main uh, part of our economy. Manufacturing is only 12 percent compared with 30 percent in China. China is still <coughs> relying much more heavily um, on manufacturing as hard as it is working to move into the service-based service um, economy. In the United States, it's easier to sort of measure and see the influence, the political influence of um, certain industries. Um, for example, if we look at campaign contributions in 2016, which was of course the year of the last presidential election, the total campaign contributions from wind and solar uh, to politicians was only four million dollars compared with 121 million from the fossil fuel industry. So you can see, you know, very overtly the type of influence um, that certain kinds of industries can have. It's much harder to discern that in China, especially because all of the big fossil fuel um, companies are state-owned firms. So they are part of the Chinese government. But we shouldn't underestimate the fact that they, they are exerting their interests in the policy process. It's just more hidden. It's less obvious uh, to us uh, as Americans. Individual leadership. Much easier to discern on the U.S. side um, because of the visibility of individual initiative. Um, we can think of um, Henry Waxman and Edward Markey as the co-sponsors of the Waxman-Markey bill, uh, which was the only climate change bill ever to pass the House. Um, you can think of someone like Al Gore, uh, who, you know, has uh, up here, mm -hmm. uh, who has, um, you know, kind of made a name for himself as being an advocate um, on climate change. And it's harder to discern, again, on the Chinese side because of the commitment in the Communist Party to collective leadership. Um, but I would say I don't think uh, we would have gotten the U.S.-China joint statement um, if not for Xi Jinping, uh, who has been a longstanding uh, minister in the National Development Reform Commission, vice minister. Um, and similarly, in terms of transforming China's ability to be able to achieve its targets, uh, former Minister Wang Gong, uh, who was an early champion of the clean energy industry, and in particular, um, China's clean vehicle uh, revolution. Um, and as a result of that, you know, China now sees economic interest in its solar, wind, electric vehicle industries um, and that's, you know, largely attributable, I think, um, to Wang Gong's uh, vision and leadership. Um, I have John Podesta here, which might surprise some of you. He was the one who led the negotiations between the U.S. and China, directly from the White House. Um, and I think that, if not for him, we probably wouldn't have had a U.S.-China deal. But he did it very stealthily, um, so most people don't know how important he was. Okay, and then finally, the role of the media. Um, we found that the influence of the media on the policymaking process uh, to be very important, hard to measure, <laughs> um, and fundamentally different in the two countries um, because of party control of the media on the Chinese side and the lack of any kind of control on the media in the, on the U.S. side. Um, so in China, all media is supervised by the propaganda department of the Communist Party. Of course, if an article is published that doesn't meet the approval of the party, it will be taken down. Um, however, Chinese um, media coverage of climate change issues uh, is actually, appears to be very open you see a pretty vigorous debate in like the opinion pages on climate change. Um, the government definitely has encouraged coverage of climate science and impacts. They want to educate the public. Um, and so that's probably been helpful in terms of uh, bringing the public along. Of course, in the United States, we love our free speech. Um, but the downside, particularly for climate change, is that 
um, the spread of misinformation and alternative facts um, has really spread through social media um, and even through the mainstream media when reporters don't know how to tell the difference between you know what's correct and what's incorrect and for years and this has been documented in the journalism literature um, journalists to kind of deal with this problem would always try to find two sides to the story even when you know there weren't really two sides um, and so these so-called balanced stories were actually misleading and imbalanced um, so uh, these are the main factors we identified and we tried to then really step back and say what can we say about the um, US approach to policy and how can we compare that with the Chinese approach <coughs> and we argued for months <laughs> about these terms um, and we landed on strategic pragmatism um, as a way to describe the Chinese approach to policy. Um, here we argue, and I've had a lot of fierce debate with Graham Allison about this, um, that communist ideology is more symbolic um, than motivational in China's policy process. We see lots of times um, in our cases on climate, at least, that the CCP adjusts its ideology to justify its actions. And I think what, what the party seeks is ma maintenance of power. Um, they want to deliver stability, improved quality of life, so that they are not, their power is not challenged, their legitimacy is not challenged. Um, they view themselves as being there for the long term. Um, they have a national goal of national rejuvenation and achievement of the, of the so-called China dream. And how this manifests itself is in a very strategic and pragmatic way. Um, they work, the government works to develop and achieve strategic objectives. It sets targets. It has a very robust planning system, <coughs> five-year plans, medium-term <laughs> plans, long-term plans. Um, even to mid-century, um, 2049, there's plans all the way to 2049, which will be the 100th anniversary of the revolution. Um, and it can do that, and it can actually deliver on all those targets because it expects to stay in power uh, during that time. Um, also, because the Chinese government's economic power is consolidating, China has the ability to really move resources behind goals it wants to set. Um, and so this concentration of financial resources allows it to achieve things that we can't seem to do in the United States. And I think a good example of that is the support of the development of the clean energy industry, uh, <coughs> which has completely eclipsed the US uh, clean energy industry. OK, by contrast, um, the term we chose for the United States is deliberative incrementalism. Um, our democratic electoral system causes most leaders to have a short-term time horizon for their policy objectives. Every single policy change is contested repeatedly in a very deliberative fashion through the legislative process and the interplay between the executive, judicial, um, and legislative branches as envisioned in the Constitution. The frequent shifts in party control of these two branches, executive and legislative, lead to very rapid swings in policy. This is super confusing on the Chinese side. Policies zigzag back and forth. They go forwards. They go backwards. Um, and you know, over many years, like over decades, if you're lucky, they consolidate into some kind of hard-won norm. You might think of like the civil rights movement as a, as a good example. Um, so politicians really want to try to show their constituents that they're making an impact. Um, so very incremental changes in policy are proposed and then proudly touted to their constituents. Um, and many elected leaders believe they can't afford to think about long-term strategic goals. Um, and I'd say in climate change policy specifically, 
we really can see incrementalism through the hundreds, literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of small regulatory steps, um, revisions to rules, contestation of rules, um, arguing about these rules in the courts. Um, so very incremental approach. And with that, I'll conclude by saying um, we probably should not expect both countries to have the same <coughs> policy outcomes in climate change policy because their structures and processes are so different. Um, but through better understanding of each other, we might turn distrust into, at a minimum, a healthy skepticism, and even better, a more pragmatic approach. Um, I do think we need to work to be more knowledgeable of each other, and I know that's what the National Committee <laughs> is here to do. Uh, we need to be less suspicious and more forgiving about our fundamental uh, differences. And we now have an opportunity to learn a lot from each other's experience in climate policy. Arguably, China is now way ahead of the United States, so we can actually learn from their experience um, and, and do something with it here in the United States. So let me stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> and let me just say thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to come and listen tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator to ask the first question. You ended up by saying that you hope we can find our way out of the mistrust so that we can work together. I don't see any sign of that happening. Um, do you? Uh, well, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm really worried. So just putting aside climate change for a second and just looking at U.S.-China relations, you know, I go to China usually three or four times a year, and I went right after Vice President Spent Pence made his it's China speech heritage. last fall. And for the first time, I had people asking me. Um, it completely hijacked my trip, because everything I was planning to do, nobody wanted to talk about. No one wanted to talk about climate change. Everyone wanted to talk about, are we at the beginning of a new Cold War? Um, and that really startled me, because I didn't think, you know, I'm, I'm sure most people didn't even notice Vice President Pence's speech here in the United States. Um, but it was really just completely dominating the news and dominating the whole narrative there. Um, and I actually, for the first time, you know, in my 20 years of going to China, could imagine that happening. Um, so I really worry about that. And I, I'm furthermore worried because I don't see any sign uh, from the Trump administration to try to find even one thing that we could cooperate with China on. You know, why is it so hard to find one thing, like, you know, working on a development project together, um, working on a global health challenge together, something cooperative that would allow the two countries to, you know, develop a narrative that we still really do have a mature relationship, that we can disagree <coughs> on things like trade or intellectual property or whatever, but we can cooperate and, and do things together on the other. All right. Questions? <coughs> Herb, please identify yourself. Uh, Herbert Levin, uh, a dues-paying member of this organization. Um, <laughs> if your answer is to read the book, it's in covering a chapter, so and so I accept that. My question is, uh, in the U.S., in trying to deal with climate change, we have gone from uh, uh, windmills and uh, I remember we were supposed to burn wood. I mean, we've <laughs> staggered through all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and only very reluctantly of the environmental lists come around and say, are really going to have to do it through nuclear power? Mm -hmm can't do it through uh, windmills and uh, all these other things. Now, this is not yet uh, an across-the-board agreed position 
in the United States, but we're being forced to it, not neglecting all these other things, but we have to go nuclear. We have not yet decided how we're going to do this, and our reactors are getting old and going out. So my question is, have the Chinese been going through the same sort of thing? Uh, they have bigger problem, and they're trying to solve it, but more slowly, very much more dependent on coal yeah, well, than, than we are. The answer is very simple, yes. They, they have actively been trying to move towards non-fossil energy. I mentioned that was one of their targets. Uh, they include nuclear in their non-fossil energy target. Um, China has more nuclear reactor construction going on than any other country in the world combined. Like all the rest of the countries combined don't have as much as China has right now. Um, so, and I would like to point out that the proportion of coal in China's energy supply has gone down from 72% to 62% in the last decade. That's, That's significant. <laughs> well, but I'm just saying, you know, for the percentage to change that dramatically over such a short amount of time means that they are really working hard. All the new things they're building are non-fossil. And it's true, they've capped coal, they've capped coal consumption, they are actively promoting, they are heavily subsidizing renewables, nuclear um, efficiency. They've worked really hard on improving efficiency. So. I think China has recognized that nuclear is going to need to be part of their um, energy equation. For the United States, in fact, it's hard to imagine the U.S. being able to achieve its targets without nuclear power, in my view. Um, I'm not, you know, I can't say I'm enthusiastic about it, primarily because it's just so expensive. You know, it is much, much more expensive than any other alternative, which is why we haven't built any reactors um, in this country except for the heavily subsidized one that's under construction in Georgia and I think is going to be the most expensive power plant in the United States ever. Um, but you know, one concern is as we have been retiring nuclear power plants in the United States, we've mostly been replacing them with gas, which actually leads to a net increase in greenhouse gas emissions. What percentage, uh, oh, I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. Um, what percentage of China's um, energy today comes from renewable sources, particularly solar and wind? And also, do you think they will meet their targets of, uh, for 2030 or, or even beat that target? I can't remember right off the top of my head what exact percentage they're at today, but I know they've overachieved their target for 2020. That was just announced. Um, and they've just increased the target that they set for themselves, which I do have at the front of mind, for electricity. So for electricity, they want to achieve 35% uh, of their electricity from non-fossil sources by 2030. Um, they are actively making you know, progress you know, year by year. It's just hard because they started from a very small base, um, but most of the new construction, new power plant capacity, almost all of it, more than 90% is non-fossil, nuclear or renewable. 90%? Yeah, on an annual basis. And they're not building co uh, gas because gas is very expensive in Asia because you're having to import LNG. Did you have a question? In the back? Oh, okay, sorry. Margo's in charge. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Samira Sabrala with United Nations Development Program. Uh, thank you very much for your um, talk today and for kind of filling out the story behind this relationship a little bit more, especially in the climate space. Um, my question is around uh, the news coming out of the Global Climate Action Summit that happened in California last year in which China was one of the co-chairs, right, in the mm -hmm. end. Um, and that was a big victory having California at the state level having a partnership with China separately. So I think that's interesting how states can kind of just, you know, ignore what's happening at the national level and do that. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, if you have any more information about how that came about and what are the implications of that and if other states are doing that and how China sees that relationship within the United States. Yeah, so we were talking about this earlier. It is very interesting. Um, and I think actually a lot of that 
dates back to that 2014 joint announcement because one of the things that the Chinese asked for was that there would be a city summit, uh, a mm -hmm. subnational city summit. And so that was committed to and we immediately started holding on an annual basis a uh, U.S.-China city summit. Um, and it turned into a state city subnational summit. Um, and so Jerry Brown started going to that and all of these sister cities and sister state arrangements started occurring, all these big announcements. Um, on the Chinese side, the central government encouraged the provinces and the cities and towns to go beyond the national target and they formed something called the Association of Peking Pioneers. Um, <laughs> And, um, and actually, you know, some of the Chinese cities have very progressive targets, like, you know, peaking by 2020. Some of them have already peaked their emissions. So it's pretty impressive. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of activity at the state and local level here in the United States. And so uh, there has been active and undiminished cooperation during this whole period, especially because the U.S. states and cities, you know, created this new movement called America's Pledge, hashtag, we are still in, uh, as in we're still in the Paris Agreement. Um, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Jerry Brown created that, um, that movement together. Um, so I think when Jerry Brown wanted to do this, he had already, he had come to those, those city summits um, and he had formed already some state-to-state -state, um, cooperative agreements. He had gotten to know Xi Jinhua. He had achieved a meeting with Xi Jinping. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was very interesting. I was surprised that Xi Jinping agreed to that. Um, and so when he invited mm -hmm. the Chinese government to co-sponsor and co-host, you know, they said yes. And I think that just indicates, and they sent uh, Xi Jinping to be one of the hosts and keynote speakers. Um, and I think that, you know, that's so out of protocol. <laughs> For those of us who've done US-China <laughs> relations protocol, it's just telling. They're trying to send the signal, we still want to cooperate with the United States. And we're going to do whatever we have to do to do that. And I think that's, it just demonstrates um, the sincerity on the Chinese side. There's somebody on this side. In the back? Yeah. Yeah, Richard. Yeah. Uh, Richard Freund, uh, former student of Professor Gallagher. Um, <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning the importance of the U.S.-China relationship to climate globally, and that makes a lot of sense. And you asked the question, if, um, if, if not the U.S. and China, then, then whom? And I was curious, are there any signs that China's looking to sort of build relationships with other countries, other groups of countries like the EU that maybe it didn't have uh, as strong a climate relationship with in the past? So I get asked that question a lot. And well, I get asked a version of that question, which is, will China now lead the world on climate? And my answer to that is, no, I don't think so. I think they will absolutely honor their pledge and they're showing every signs of honoring the commitments they made in Paris so far. Uh, but I think China did not ever want to be the leader of the world on climate. Um, I think they very much relished having a partner. Um, they need the United States to justify their own action domestically. I mean, put yourself in China's shoes. You've got this rapidly <laughs> developing economy per capita income far lower than the United States. Uh, how do you justify to your own people that you're taking these kind of draconian steps? They're shutting down steel plants. They're shutting down concrete factories, shutting down coal-fired power plants, making people buy electric vehicles now. <laughs> you know, how do you justify doing all of that when the U.S. isn't doing anything? And there is growing pushback in China. Um, for doing that. That being said, I think um, Europe has tried to sort of step up and replace the United States, and they just don't seem to have the same cachet <laughs> um, in China. I, I think 
an individual leader in Europe, like the country is just too small. There are also, those leaders are all pretty distracted uh, right now um, and not really focused uh, so much on climate or China. Um, I think, you know, potentially an interesting alliance could be China and India um, because I think that the politics of climate are really starting to change in India um, and, uh, you know, you could have sort of a, a new growth model um, and a new development model that's demonstrated by those two countries. Um, how that would manifest itself in terms of the international negotiations, I'm not entirely clear, but that would be interesting. And yes, you, you, yes, you. <laughs> I can't see your. You answered the yes. question um, in large part. That I, I had a question of was, was there a force in China that wanted to slow this down? Um, mm -hmm. But since I think you've answered that, I wanted to ask a different question, if that's right. Um, how much of the intransigence in the United States is just the uh, stranded assets of big oil? That mm -hmm. It's like we don't know how to value these energy companies if they can't burn everything that they've got rights to, and probably the, plan the planet can't survive if they burn everything they've got rights to now. So is that the, is that why, you know, we have intransigence on our side? Is there, there more to it? Um, well, I actually think, you know, not for a long time will, will oil suffer um, <laughs> under, you know, any plausible climate change policy, any politically plausible, plausible policy because, um, you know, uh, oil is not nearly as carbon intensive as coal. So as soon as you start trying to reduce emissions, the, the fuel that, you know, really has to be addressed is coal because it's three times as carbon intensive as, as natural gas. Um, so we certainly, you know, I don't see a future for the coal industry unless we uh, can manage to achieve carbon capture and storage. Um, and you know, maybe it's just rhetoric, but most of the oil companies have now said they support a carbon tax or, you know, a cap and trade program. We, we, we would need to test that, you know, if there was legislation pending. I don't think any of them are actively lobbying for something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but even ExxonMobil, you know, and it's interesting, when Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State, he supported staying in. Paris very publicly, you know, went against the president, and I think that was emblematic of where Exxon was at that point. Um, BP's new corporate strategy is called Advancing Low Carbon, um, and they have made a billion dollar investment into low carbon um, technology. So I think some of these companies are, are trying, now whether they can actually do this, you know, to imagine themselves as energy companies, not oil and gas companies, um, and trying to achieve that transition. Um, actually, BP owns the largest wind business in the United States. So, you know, I don't know. On the other hand, they oppose the carbon tax uh, that was on the ballot in Washington State. Um, and Even put though they a lot of money into a uh, apparent, well, I don't know how much BP <clears throat> specifically did, well, but the oil and gas yeah. industry did oppose it. They didn't like the details, you know, of the. <laughs> um, so I think, um, you know, it's sort of interesting. Clearly, the coal industry will suffer. Um, it's not clear to me how much the oil and gas industry will suffer, especially if they can make this transition uh, during this time frame. Yeah. Please identify yourself. Uh, Angela, um, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I've got a question on some of the other comments and questions. So um, I guess, where do you see the Paris Agreement going now, like, going forward, for the Trump, I guess, like, involved with like, the Trump administration is the UN is potentially another court move. Right. And uh, other, company, uh, other countries going to step in. And also, why wouldn't China be interested in, I guess, it was already pursuing its targets to keep that active and play more active role in yeah. 
Okay, well, you know, it's complicated because actually the U.S. is still in the Paris Agreement. Um, and I was at the climate negotiations in, in Poland late last year. And it was very interesting because the U.S. is still a party, it still has to sit there and negotiate. So it did some very unpleasant things like refuse to welcome the report from the scientists on how we would achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. You know, it was literally an argument about the word, you know, that, that the parties would welcome this report. Um, but on the other hand, the U.S. and China co-chaired the transparency negotiations, and that was what countries are going to be reporting on, um, you know, what they had to submit in their reports, you know, how we would know if each other is complying, all of those rules, because what we were trying to achieve in Paris was finalizing the, the rule book, so to speak, for the Paris Agreement. So that was interesting. You know, I think that was done like lower level bureaucracy. <laughs> but the U.S. was actually pretty constructive, you know, in that regard in Poland. Um, something that's not well understood is that the U.S. cannot actually pull out of Paris until the day after the next presidential election. Um, <laughs> I point out that even if Trump loses, he will still be president that day. Um, so he could make good on his promise to withdraw uh, if he, if he, even if he lost. But I think it would be unlikely that he would do that. Um, though maybe, you know, if he was vindictive enough. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, if he withdrew and, you know, if there was a climate supporter who was the next president, they could immediately accede. Uh, so a lot rides on the next election. I mean, <laughs> there's no getting around that. Um, and I think the other thing I would say about Paris is, you know, when Trump made his announcement that he was, you know, intended to withdraw, um, that was right during the first round of negotiations after Paris. It was in Morocco. I remember vividly how uncomfortable it was to be there as a former Obama administration official. Um, and country after country said, um, we're in it for the long term. We're going to stick with this agreement. We're going to honor this agreement. And there really hasn't been um, a pulling back um, in general, except now we have Brazil. So Brazil and maybe Turkey have both sort of indicated they might um, pull out. And, you know, undoubtedly it's not helpful <laughs> for the U.S. to take the position that it's taken. Uh, but I think a lot of people think this is hopefully, you know, maybe it's wishful thinking, a temporary blip, the U.S. will be back in, and we can get down to business again. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah. yeah. How optimistic are you that the efforts of U.S. states and cities will offset the Trump administration's backward approach? Um, I do think that they will do some offsetting. Unquestionably, I don't think it's enough. Uh, from all the modeling I've seen, uh, you just can't quite <coughs> get there uh, without a federal approach, particularly to the power sector. Because the progressive you know, progressive states and even those conservative states I mentioned earlier um, are, are doing a lot, but then there's some states that aren't do any, and doing anything at all. And those are typically the states with a lot of coal-fired power plants. Claudia, I know her, <laughs> another <laughs> former student. <laughs> well, I was just also former student. Uh, Claudia and also with uh, Samira and UNDP. Um, so, first of all, congratulations, and, and thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, I just wanted to touch on what you just mentioned in regards um, China not doing what it's doing, um, you know, having a hard time justifying to, to the people, like, why are we doing this if the U.S. is not doing it? I would think there is some economic rationale to be made here, some economic case to be made here. And I think you touched also on maybe the reason why, because it's a, it's a long-termism approach that China has as opposed to the short-termism approach that U.S. politicians have. You know, we have four years at the most, eight to deliver on anything, whereas 
um, in the Chinese government, they think long term. Um, so maybe the economic goals and the economic gains of doing this shift to renewables will mm -hmm. come later. Mm -hmm. And as a follow up on that, what is your insight in regards to divesting? Um, you know, a lot of corporations, whether their banks, BlackRock and, and other corporations are now divesting from uh, high emitting industries or sectors. Uh, I don't know if that's occurring in China, it's sort of occurring in the US. So would that be probably a future where like, it doesn't matter if we have a Paris deal, it doesn't matter if we have a policy agreement, but it is such an economic case that you know we're just gonna stop investing in this and, and then these markets will just suffer. Well, on the divestment point, I think you'd be crazy not to, um, because I think it's really clear that you know the world generally is moving. You know, the the world has accepted the Paris Agreement, and that implies we're we're going to be reducing emissions a lot. Uh, so I think there's a lot of financial risk, um, you know, for continuing to invest in carbon intensive infrastructure. Um, in China, you know, one thing that's interesting is that all the renewable companies are private or locally state-owned. Um, and all the fossil fuel companies are state-owned enterprises. And so that does create a kind of interesting political dynamic because, um, you know, the government in a way has a vested interest in keeping the fossil fuel industries alive. But I think they truly don't want to do that. Um, but that might explain a little bit um, some of the motivation behind China's Belt and Road Initiative because um, I have a, another recent paper um, looking at Chinese investments into coal-fired power um, in Southeast Asia. And it turns out China is actually the leading investor in coal-fired power plants in Southeast Asia. So here they are doing all this wonderful stuff I've been talking about. <laughs> Domestically, they're trying to reduce emissions, reduce coal consumption, but understandably, you know, they're financing and then providing the equipment <coughs> from their state-owned enterprises, these coal <coughs> power, power plants overseas. So economically, that is totally rational, right? They have a ton of workers in these industries. They have big companies. Um, you can understand why they would want. So this allows China to meet its target and honor its Paris commitment, you know, but give an economic lifeline to these industries um, through the export of these, of these technologies. Um, interestingly, Xi Jinping recently gave a speech saying that it could no longer be justified uh, to do this and that it was important to start greening the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and that actually doesn't surprise me at all. Here's a nice example of where there's probably some disagreement internally because you have these powerful state-owned enterprises and all these workers associated with those enterprises <coughs> pushing back um, and you know Xi Jinping understanding that this isn't tenable from a climate point of view so this will be a process that unfolds over time. Yeah. Robert, pension advisor. Um, is there a new model for how the knowledge behind policy on the U.S. system can be preserved rather than lost? Yeah. Uh, you referred to silos and competing entities we know, but is there a way to, what, are there any vehicles or organizations? You mean within the U.S. bureaucracy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Academic and, and industry and investment, I don't know. Um, so I recently heard a talk uh, by Gina McCarthy, who's the former administrator of EPA. And you know, I expected her to be wringing her hands about all of the regulations that she worked so hard to put in place, uh, you know, being challenged in the courts. And she said, I'm not worried about that at all. In fact, we're prevailing in the courts. We've won most of those court cases. I think eventually all those rulemakings are gonna stand but I'm terribly worried about the loss of um, knowledge in the agency because you know, people are leaving in droves, either being forced out or just so demoralized that they can't 
stay in. And I don't honestly know what the solution is. I mean, you know, the question is, will they come back? Maybe not once they've, you know, taken a retirement or moved into a, another position. So it's a, it's a real danger. Um, and I think, you know, I see that most acutely, I guess, related to climate in the EPA and in the State Department, um, where the whole Special Envoy's Office for Climate Change was killed. The, um, the uh, head of the Office of Global Change, who had been there for many, many years, a Fletcher graduate, I might add, uh, Dan Reefsnar, I mean, I think he'd been there for three decades, um, knew every treaty inside and out, just couldn't bear it and retired. Um, though he didn't, you know, he was far from being old, you know, <laughs> he just <laughs> couldn't take it. Uh, so I think we're really losing a lot of knowledge and capacity. On the other hand, I think a lot of those people would want to help if they could. Um, but, but something's going to have to be done to, to, you know, retain that or recapture, rebuild that knowledge. Yeah. Hi. Um, Vicki Chen from Deloitte Consulting, also incoming intern to the committee. Um, thank you, Professor Gallagher. My question, um, which is actually interesting, was sparked by the investment, China's investment in the Southeast Asia mm -hmm. um, area, is that I know we um, primarily focus on the titans of the world today, but for some of the smaller and underdeveloped countries who may have just been going through the debate between agricultural society, mm -hmm. truly natural society, exactly. and we are in this global agreement that you know fossil oil, coal are somewhat unhealthy to the earth. Is it possible for those smaller countries to jump directly to wind and solar power, to the cleaner energy, without going through what some of the more developed countries have gone through in the past few centuries? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that is the question actually about the future because you know it's not just Southeast Asia but Africa so and those by the way are the Belt and Road countries um, it's uh, it's very interesting to me that um, at least you know we we looked at Indonesia Vietnam Bangladesh and India which is not a Belt and Road country defiantly not a Belt and Road country um, and those were the four largest recipients of, of coal finance um, you know, those countries actually have plans that are inconsistent with their own pledges under the Paris Agreement. So it's very confusing. <laughs> um, and I think uh, many of them have just not yet grasped what it would take, you know, to reform their economic development plans, their energy strategies. You know, there's just sort of this incoherence in their policy approach which is perfectly understandable. You know, they're focused on development. They're, as you just said, you know, trying to move up that industrialization curve. Um, if all those countries, you know, if Southeast Asia <coughs> and Africa do what China just did, there's no chance of achieving the Paris Agreement. Um, so that, in my mind, um, tells me that we have a really strong role to play, and China does too, uh, to help those countries avoid that and find that new green industrialization model, uh, that new, um, new development pathway uh, that really does enable them to leapfrog uh, to cleaner technologies and practices and industries. Um, so it's not fair in a way uh, to them, but on the other hand, you know, to be able to avoid all the conventional air pollution, that would be pretty great for a lot of these countries. Um, to avoid all the health damages, you know, there's a lot of positive aspects if we can find, you know, a new growth model uh, that's cleaner. Yeah. Do you think the uh, talk of small, relatively modest, nuclear reactors, I mean, now are completely safe reactors are only carriers and the cruisers, nothing right. smaller. Yeah. But smaller ones seem to be getting closer. Now, you take a country like, uh, like Thailand or Bangladesh, uh, 
a relatively modest size uh, reactor going in there mm -hmm. would solve uh, their problem. Do you see this as a possibility? And as part of this question, the U.S. restrictions on yeah. exporting nuclear technology seem to leave this field to the Japanese and the French and anybody else. Uh, could you go into those things? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually an interesting question because, as you may know, um, the Trump administration just issued new export controls prohibiting export of small modular reactors, um, which was devastating for Bill Gates, who has invested a lot in this new company, TerraPower, which he was planning to demonstrate in China. Um, and he had made some significant investments in China. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of potential. Um, and, you know, nobody really knows the economics of the SMRs yet, but, you know, they seem like they could be very promising. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential. Um, I'm a big believer in an all of the above sort of approach. Uh, I don't think that you can do it all with just solar, just wind, or just nuclear. Um, but I do think we need a portfolio approach in all of these countries. Uh, what about fusion technology? Mm -hmm. I attended a lecture on that a few <coughs> years ago, and it seemed to have so much potential, but nothing yeah. seems to have come of it. It perennially has so much potential. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we still don't have fusion, um, but we're still investing a lot in it, actually. Um, it accounts for a significant portion of the U.S. energy research development demonstration budget, um, R&D. &D. Jan was like, what's R&D? &D? Or not Jan, Margo. Um, and we have invested in it, you know, for many decades now. Um, it's one of those line items that has always been there. Uh, because it has proven so difficult, I think it was in the Clinton administration, we created an international consortium called ITER, which I can't remember what that stands for. International Thermo Engineering something. Oh, reactor. That's what it is. So it's an international consortium that's cost sharing, you know, on these clearly mm -hmm. pre-commercial R&D costs uh, for fusion. Um, and I think that's exactly the right thing to do. Um, because it's been so expensive. I mean, some have argued that we've put so much money into fusion, uh, just the U.S. government alone, that maybe could have been better deployed, you know, in other technologies. Um, but, you know, if it ever does work, it would be great. <laughs> and it would be a carbon-free source. So, yeah, I'm in favor of continuing to invest in it. Uh, uh, my name is Jasmine Wong. Uh, right now, I'm working with Columbia University on the, as a producer of impact investing case studies. Ah. Um, can you recommend some cases that China and U.S. can work together on the private sector on the impact investing? Hmm. None spring hmm. to mind. Um, in terms of U.S.-China collaboration on impact investing. That's interesting. Um, but, you know, they're, like the, the birth of the Chinese renewables industry was largely supported by foreign venture capital. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, there is local state ownership, as I mentioned before, of some of those, you know, or partial local state ownership. Um, but there was a lot of investing uh, in those firms uh, in, the, in the early days. Um, many people assume that the you know, Chinese government was behind the, the growth of that industry, but really they weren't. Um, but in terms of impact investing specifically, I can't think of any, any examples off the top of my head. Good question. Yeah. Chris, can you? No. <laughs> All right, we are at exactly 7 o'clock by my watch. Um, 
I, <coughs> excuse me. I would like to issue a special invitation to Professor Gallagher's former students who are here for the first time. We hope it won't be the last. <laughs> um, for all of you, again, thank you for coming, and thank you very much for a really stimulating talk. Maybe there is room for optimism. The book is available out there for purchase, and Kelly promises to sign them. Yes, for of you. course. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>